So, hello again, and uh, we stopped at uh, estimating the channel capacity depending on error probability. Uh, this formula has only one parameter, variable parameter, this error probability, which we can change in range from 0 to 1. Uh, maximum probability is 1, minimum probability is 0. Yes, so let us see how it looks like by writing this short script. It's very simple, yes. I have selected one microsecond uh, pause duration because we need to specify a rectangular pause duration, one symbol duration, which is uh, tau, and uh, implemented this formula. It's pretty straightforward, yes, one plus error probability multiplied with logarithm error probability, one minus error probability multiplied with logarithm one minus per error. And after that, I divided everything that with tau according to this formula, right? So let's see how it looks like. And it looks like this uh, line. Yes, it's a little bit interesting. What we would expect is that the greater is error probability, the slower its transmission rate is. However, we can see that uh, here we have at zero error probability, literally uh, one megabit per second, here at 0 0.5 error probability, our data rate is completely at zero. This is zero exactly. And again, at error probability of one, we have one megabit per second. So it's com completely understandable that with increasing of error probability, our data rate or capacity decreases. That is fine. However, uh, we may have questions why we start increasing here. Well, that is basically because um, consider the case you have receiving the signal with 100% error. You know for sure that each symbol is incorrect. All that is left is that you uh, change the symbol to the opposite and now you have correct symbols. Yes, so basically 100 error probability means that each symbol is incorrect and knowing that fact, you can reverse, inverse each of the symbols and therefore correct all the errors without any efforts, yes? So, uh, accordingly, uh, this means that actually 100% error probability is not the worst case. What the worst case is uh, error probability 50%. That is because we are completely unaware if there is error or there is no error. The data becomes completely chaotic and it is impossible to receive any anything at all because everything can be with error and without error and we don't even know if that error happened and or not. Accordingly, if the error probability is not so high, uh, the errors are occurring uh, quite rarely and, uh, well, they take only a small fraction of the that transmission rate to repeat uh, the uh, missing part of the information. Uh, yes. Now, if the error probability is 0 0.5, it's completely unusable channel. Now, of course, in practice, <laughs> the completely unusable channels are starting somewhere here. Yes. Uh, as 0 0.1 error probability, which is very high error probability. What we'd like to have in practice is actually 10 at the minus 6 degree error probability. That is something tolerable for us. It's not good, it, but it's tolerable, yes. Good is considered like 10 minus 9 degree. That is good. Yes, of course, real channels channels don't work like that, and we don't have uh, such statistics, unfortunately, and we have to find solutions. One of these solutions is error correcting codes. Yes, so for this, I hope it's now more clear to you that uh, error prob the maximum, uh, well, let us say the worst error probability is actually 0 0.5, not one because one means each symbol is inverse and uh, you just uh, inverse them invert them yourself once again and uh, everything is solved no problems yes the 
Worst case is when you don't know which symbols are inverted and which are not. And the maximum uncertainty in this regard is 50-50, yes? 50% it's inverted, 50% it's not inverted. Because if we have like 70% it's inverted and 30% it's not inverted, it's literally the same as 30% inverted and 70% not inverted, yes? Uh, so that's why this line is symmetric, respecting to, respect to this uh, 0 0.5 point, yes, because it doesn't really matter uh, for binary system. Yes, once again, I'd like to mention that we we are talking about uh, that binary, yes, binary, uh, because for non-binary it's a little bit more tricky, yes. Okay, so we can go further. Uh, now I'm not going to need it anymore for now. Let's see, before we start talking about coding itself, let's see about Shannon's uh, theorem and his limit. What is Shannon's limit and uh, what is his theorem? So, as I said before, uh, before Shannon, it was considered that it's completely impossible to avoid errors, yes? <clears throat> that we have noise, and because of this noise we have errors, and, uh, well, literally there is nothing we can do about it, yes? That's what has been considered. However, Shannon proved that it is possible to eliminate completely any errors under certain conditions. So these are following conditions. First, so that we are use specific code, strong enough error correcting code, for this specified signal to noise ratio. Of course, he didn't really show how to make these codes. He only told that such codes exist. Yes, he doesn't know what. Well, he did. He did provide some uh, examples. Yes, of making such codes, but it wasn't like too theoretical work. Regardless, it uh, was a signal to other researchers, to other scientists, to start working on such codes, and shortly these codes have been mathematically proven, yes, and uh, designed, and this theory started to uh, uh, develop, yes. Uh, so, anyway, we need to use a strong enough code. That is the main part, yes, because well, if the code will not be strong enough, there will still be errors. However, this is not sufficient condition. In order for all of this to work in real time, as we already discussed a little bit earlier, we need to make sure that data generation speed doesn't exceed the channel capacity. Channel capacity uh, limit, yes. So, uh, our channel has to be able to send data faster than uh, data is being generated. With some epsilon, which is how mathematicians say, arbitrary small unit, arbitrary or measure. So it uh, is uh, close to zero, some delta, yes. Okay, so the trick is, as you imagine here, with making such code. And uh, basically that, as I said, uh, alone, uh, after seeing this Shannon theorem's proof, so it's called a Shannon theorem for reason, that it is actually possible to solve and prove it mathematically. So he provided this proof and it was, uh, well, uh, how to say it, uh, there will no uh, no more any doubts that it is possible to use this coding for such purpose. He did prove it, yes, and uh, well, as I said, such codes started to emerge. And we are going now to start talking about these codes, but before that, let us see what is Shannon limit and how coding can help us in approaching to this Shannon limit, yes? So, mostly practical systems generate data slower than the channel can transmit. 
and it's impossible to send data without errors if data is generated faster than channel can transmit and we don't use any memory any buffering and so forth the example with youtube i was uh, telling you about in last lecture uh, has some buffer memory so basically uh, we have some memory and all the data we are receiving is stored in this buffer and then once this buffer is filled we can play back it on our video. If we don't use this buffer, then we'll just um, unavoidably miss some of the data because consider that a uh, source is generating one, uh, no, 10 gigabits per second, yes, and you only have internet connection for one gigabit per second, meaning that without any buffering, you will lose roughly 90% of all the information. Only one gigabit of these 10 gigabits will be delivered. The other will be just lost, yes? So this is similar example, yes? So this is unattainable. And between them, there is the limit, the line, which is also a called uh, channel capacity and power efficiency limit, or for short, channel limit, yes? So, and this is actually the limit and uh, well our real systems do not really work this fast yes all our systems are below this limit so you can read more mathematical uh, derivation about this limit here yes also there is a small program which plots this limit for you uh, if you are interested in more details yes but uh, let us talk more about uh, what does it really mean, this limit. So the, uh, Shannon has added into this formula, yes, signal to noise ratio. So we had channel capacity formula uh, depending on uh, just error probability, yes. So here you can see channel capacity really does depend on this error probability. However, Shannon uh, added to that formula not uh, error probability itself, but signal to noise ratio, which naturally affects this error probability, of course, yes. Uh, so now we have this delta F, which is bandwidth and log two of the error probability, not error probability, I'm sorry, um, signal to noise ratio plus one. So here, this is the signal power and PN is the noise power, yes? So basically this formula, accordingly, the higher is signal to noise ratio, uh, the lower is uh, this capacity, yes? And well, this is actually, uh, well, considering uh, that signal to noise ratio can be infinite large, yes, and then the capacity will not be limited. However, as the signal to noise ratio per signal to per noise approaches to zero, yes, this can be eliminated. We are left with this, log two of one is zero, right? Any logarithm of one is zero. And capacity will be also zero. So this, if we, if we plot this line, so here we have P signal divided by P noise, it will look like uh, this, yes? Some channel capacity here, maximum and here we'll have zero at zero signal to noise ratio so uh, more often than this we are using so-called eff spectral efficiency parameter because uh, well as you imagine different modulation types different system even different pulse duration tau can lead to different channel speed and uh, bandwidth and you already know that we can use uh, alpha parameter in range 0 0.5 to 1 which accordingly 
changes the relationship between uh, delta F and C. So in order to avoid altogether all this hassle, yes, we are often using uh, normalized efficiency. Yes, so we divide capacity with the bandwidth and therefore we are left with just this formula without bandwidth anymore. So uh, when we evaluate the efficiency of communication system, meaning that how close are we to maximum data rate, yes? Uh, then, well, we are using this formula, yes. So basically, this is this line. So, for example, different modulation types have different efficiency, yes. Now here we have Shannon capacity limit, yes. And, uh, well, we can also plot somewhere here at one uh, BPSK, BASK, BFSK, all these known by us modulation types. So these modulation types at most transmit only one uh, bit per hertz per hertz per second. Yes, so basically uh, QPSK a modulation type now sends two bits per one signal and therefore its efficiency is higher. Yes, it's two. Uh, 16CAM transmits four symbols. Yes, basically log two of M, where M is uh, four here, 16, 32, 64 and so forth. Yes, See, and here for 1024 quadratrupled modulation, its efficiency is at 10, yes. As you can see, this also depends on signal to noise ratio, yes. Even though uh, our maximum efficiency for this modulation type is 10, we only start to see this efficiency at signal to noise ratio 40 decibel. Before that, at 35 decibel, we are not much better than this 50. 512 quadratrupled modulation. This is because of the same distance between signals, yes? For example, if I plot you QPSK uh, signal constellation here and CAM16 constellation, you will see one obvious uh, detail about these two constellations. So this is QPSK, four signals, with different phase shifts, yes. So here we have P divided by two, here we have oh, P divided by four, here we'll have P divided by two more, and so forth and so forth. So for CAM16 modulation type, we'll talk more about these modulation types later, yes, but for now, just uh, some uh, specific details. As you imagine, there will be 16 of these points, yes. So we'll have all these points as well in these positions, which are last points. And in between, we'll have even more of these points, yes? So basically here, 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 and what we can observe from here, that the distance between these points is actually smaller, yes? And that is why errors will happen much more often. In order to eliminate this problem, we have to increase the signal to noise ratio compared between QPSK. And if QPSK was able to achieve its limit at five or I don't know, seven, at let's say seven decibel, then 16 CAM uh, needs around 15 decibel, yes? In because, well, we need to actually improve this distance, yes, somehow. So what we do is we increase, well, I didn't draw it really correctly because this distance must be the same as this. Well, I can actually just open it in Google. Yes. And you can see that it's actually having 
the same distances between these points, not like I have drawn, yes. And for QPSK, we would have only these points, which obviously has greater distance between them than for quadrature amplitude shift K. And for, as you imagine, uh, yes, as you imagine, it's quite simple to, let us ask the 256 uh, constellation. Yes, even less distance between these points. And uh, therefore, this needs even higher signal to noise ratio in order to receive data correctly without errors. Yes, that would be around 20, uh, 27 or even 30 decibel. Now, however, theoretically, at 30 decibel, as you can see, Shannon capacity could give us 12. 12, not 10, yes. So we didn't really achieve this capacity in practice. So yes, there is some something to work on. Yes, for us, we don't leave. Uh, we don't really achieve even at high signal to noise ratio. And as signal to noise ratio will increase, also this theoretical capacity will continue to grow. Yes. However, for this modulation type, we are limited now. Yes, and the better is signal to noise ratio, the greater this difference will be. We can, of course, start using 4048 cam, which will accordingly give us, well, it look like, like, like this somehow, yes. But again, the situation will sooner or later repeat and uh, we will not reach this capacity. And in fact, it's not really a problem because signal to noise ratio 40 is extremely exceedingly good signal to noise ratio. We don't usually work with that. We usually work with that or even with negative signal to noise ratio, yes. So what needs to be fixed is this part, yes. We'd like to approach to this limit as close as possible here. And the coding is what helps us to do that, yes. So consider, for example, this limit yes now we are plotting here uh, yes so signal to noise ratio this capacity and here we now plot uh, efficiency yes also well basically the same picture as here only in a logarithmical scale on x-axis so here we have without calling our quadrature amplitude modulation and it accordingly slowly approaches this limit. Now we can add different coding, for example, read Solomon coding, yes. And after adding this coding, we'll be here. As you can see, yes, we improved and got closer to this limit because of this coding. This difference is called coding gain. This is what we gain by using the code, yes? And accordingly, there are different generations of the codes. So first generation is read Solomon codes. Second generation is convolutional concatenated codes. Third generation is turbo codes. Now I think it's LDPC coding, uh, which is actively studied, yes? And slowly and slowly, we are getting closer and closer to this limit. Yes, we can see more information here. Yes, about uh, different. Uh, so this is allowed. Yes, okay. I believe somewhere we had. So yes, different modulation types. Yes, also have different efficiency. Uh, Shannon's formula, by the way. Yes, and. Uh, formulas for different modulation types error probability also yes you can see uh, here that this q is this error function cumulative yes no so we have erf and we have rfc uh, i believe octave also have rfc yes though this complementary error function so basically <laughs> we can say that rfc is nothing different than one minus erf. Yes, opposite. 
whatever. Opposite probability. But okay, no, this is not in this presentation then. But where was that? Somewhere I had uh, pictures uh, with how close we have gotten to this limit. Ah, I didn't, uh, I didn't scroll to the end. Yes, sorry. So sorry. Okay. Optimization. Spectral efficiency. Well, somewhere around here, but ah, no, not yet. So, quadrature amplitude modulation, GPSK. Quite large presentation, but uh, unfortunately, I can't find. Well, okay, maybe I will show you next time this picture, not spend too much time today, but uh, there are codes, some of the codes, which allow us to get almost, for example, like around here already. We didn't really reach this limit itself yet, but uh, with some codes, with some systems, we can approach very close to that limit today. And this is about efficiency, yes, how effectively we use bandwidth which is a limited resource yes which as you now know affect directly the speed at which we can transmit data yes so basically uh, if we don't really use it effectively we we didn't really achieve the highest possible data transmission rate which is not good and also each user requires his own bandwidth yes and as the number of devices and users continue to grow in the world it's clear that we need to be as effective with our bandwidth as we can yes and this is actually well a nice um, measurement yes how effective is our system is it here or is it here yes for the same spectral efficiency so yes, all these points are different types of modulation. So for example, uh, where it's, so it's three, it's four, it's CAM16. Yes, because it has four, it's CAM32. So basically two at the power of five, two at the power of four and so forth and so forth, yes, without coding. And with coding, as you can see, it improves. So, okay, let us start talking about the codes themselves. Yes, so it's clear now that we need them. And uh, the, well, tolerable, let us say, pair for us, bit error rate, yes, would be 10 at the degree of minus six. However, real channels in, bet, in best case can provide us with pair of, for example, minus four which means that errors are happening 100 times more often than we'd hope to, yes? And uh, how can we work with that? With that, we work by using these codes which Shannon proposed to use, yes? Uh, as I told, Shannon didn't really uh, invent those codes, yes? Uh, but he showed the, the possible application of these codes and therefore, other people started to look for such codes. Um, so what is the basic principle of these error correcting codes? You already know the principle of Huffman, Shannon Fano codes, that their purpose was to uh, reduce redundancy. Yes, so we, uh, how to say it, extract all the non-relevant information from our message and send only the most important part of this message. However, this makes this message more susceptible to error. So the error in this highly dense information costs us more than it costed in original message, yes? Uh, well, for example, consider some word, I don't know. Let us take a word, correlation. Cor 
Now, if the error happens somewhere here, for example, in this letter T, and we receive letter B instead, it's not so difficult to understand that it's error for us, yes, what word was mentioned. However, if now we skip uh, some letters, so, yes, and the error happens here, it is more difficult to understand that it was mentioned correlation before, yes, so the errors become worse in compressed message. So the obvious trick is to use opposite uh, approach to actually add information and uh, uh, send more data than necessary in order to be able to correct the code. And that is how these codes work. So redundancy is not always bad thing, yes? Um, uh, sometimes redundancy can help us correct errors. So one, the negative side of the redundancy is it takes more time to transmit all this redundancy. The positive side is that it increases reliability of our information. So we can trust more of this information. So the error correcting codes just add some redundancy and uh, I'd like to mention that the amount of added redundancy is absolutely minimum required. Yes, we don't add uh, just some, uh, some redundancy as we want. We calculate how many redundancy do we need to add to make it possible to correct errors. And accordingly, the redundancy itself is based on data which we are transmitting. So we don't just add some random redundancy. Yes, we add some redundancy which is based on data. So that is the idea of this course. We'll talk uh, many lectures more about this coding. We'll discuss group coding. We'll discuss cyclic coding. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> show you. I, I we will show you the examples for your course project as well. How to make these codes, how to check how they work, and so forth and so on. But the common principle for these codes will be the same. We add some control symbols, yes. Control symbols. The number of these control symbols and the values of these control symbols are strictly calculated uh, based on the information part, which we'd like to protect from errors. Yes, so this principle is same for all the codes. So what is the general idea for error detection. Let us start with more simple case because as you imagine it is easier to find error than to correct it. Uh, so let us consider that we make some code words of specific length m. For example, let us say that m will be 4 and therefore I can make 16 code words, yes, starting with all zeros. Well, I won't write really all of them 16 because it's quite simple to understand what I mean. Yes, and ending with all the one total of two power of four code words. Yes, 16 code words. So here M is a small letter and M capital will be the number of these code words. 16, yes, in this particular case. So uh, what we are going to do now? Now we are going to tell that not all of these code words will be legitimate. Yes, so basically we'll tell that some of these code words are illegal. So basically restricted. So for example, let us say that we'll have these, these, and these code words as restricted. So that means that the source can never give us this code. So if we do receive this combination at the receiver, then we know for certain that this cannot be correct and that is error. Yes, so this is the basic principle of error detection. We split all our possible code words into two categories, which are allowed accordingly, which have been generated during the transmission and which are restricted, which cannot be generated by source. And the only way how these restricted code words can appear is 
the situation when a loud code word has been uh, has been incorrectly received because of the noise. So it has been distorted by the noise from a loud code word into restricted code word. And that is actually indeed the error and this error has been successfully found, yes. So the error process in this case can be described as a conversion of the allowed code word into a restricted code word. And uh, such error codes indeed do exist. It, the very simple code is parity checking code, which I'll show you example. And uh, well, in this case, after we find out we have an error, we need to request uh, by using feedback channel. So we have communication system transmitter, uh, receiver, direct channel, which sends data, and also we will need a feedback channel which is used to request to repeat some problematic code word, yes. So if the code word is with error, then we need to res resend it again, yes. So that is the idea. So before we go further, correction, let me show you a simple example of the code which can detect errors. We already discussed that probably, which is called parity checking code. So consider we have this data block which we need to be sent. Now we are going to add one extra symbol so that the total number of symbols one is even number. So we have one, two, three symbols one. So in order to have even number of ones, we need to add one extra one, yes? And this is the allowed code word, yes? So the source calculated all the symbols put here one, and this is a loud code. Now consider that during the transmission, the error has happened somewhere. Well, let us say it happened uh, here, yes. So this is the position where error is happening. And now we have received restricted code word. Restricted in a sense that it has one, two, three, four, five symbols one. All restricted code words have odd number of ones. All, all allowed code words have even number of ones. So this way we can see that this is actually an error. Now, if we would receive this, sim this for example, with two errors, then it is still allowed code word, yes, because we have even number of symbols one, and we cannot see such error with this code, yes, so it's needed to understand that each code has its limits. It doesn't, it isn't all the powerful, yes, and uh, one error can be detected, two cannot with this code. So all the even number errors will be unnoticed by this code, unfortunately, yes. But nevertheless, this still shows the idea very clearly that we have some sort, some code words which are possible and some code words which are impossible to be generated. Now, let us go further and see how we can actually correct error if we have received it with error. Now we make subsets of restricted code words, yes. So all the restricted code words are now distributed between allowed code words. So we make some groups of the code words, yes. For example, here you can see one such group, yes. In this group, we have one allowed code word and multiple, well, let us say n restricted code words. So if we receive any of these code words, then we automatically assume that the, this allowed code word was expected to be sent, yes. Of course, we put here as restricted code words uh, the ones which are the most resembling this allowed. So I will show you example now more specifically. Consider this uh, group. So this is only one group, for example, this group, yes. And inside we can see eight code words. The allowed code word, this one, 
and seven restricted code words. Each of these restricted code words differs in one symbol from this allowed code word. Yes, so you can see this first restricted code word is actually allowed code word with error in first position, and this last one is accordingly with error in last position. So the idea is if we receive code word, for example, this code word, then we know for certain that instead in in no well in reality it was expected to be received this one yes so we just replace this code word with this code word and that's all that is how shannon actually proposed this coding procedure based on tables and memories yes we just make some tables uh, distribute restricted code words between uh, allowed code words and uh, basically that's it yes if we receive any of these eight code words we assume that it was expected to send this code word of course making such tables by hand can be quite tedious yes and difficult and we need to well be very careful so that we don't assign the same restricted code words to multiple allowed code words yes each restricted code word can appear only once in all these tables uh, they need to be as close to allowed code word as possible in other uh, well from the other side allowed code words have to be as different as possible because of this yes so it's not quite easy to do that by hand. You can try if you'd like to, but I assure you that it won't be necessary for our case because, as I said, different other scientists started to search for mathematical methods, yes, for theory, for, for some theoretical ways to design these codes without the necessity to uh, make these tables by hand. And they found them, yes, so we have now some specific operations to do and this distribution is therefore achieved for us automatically yes we don't have to sit and distribute these code words between these categories it will be happening itself if we can mention yes so the idea i hope is quite understandable now we need to do that correctly so in this particular case we will have in total only 16 allowed code words. Each of them will have seven restricted. So in total, there will be seven multiplied by 16 restricted code words. Well, and in total, it will be 128 code words. So as you can see, in order to be able to correct only one error in these seven symbols, we need to set 16 allowed code words out of 128 total code words, yes? And there is total of 112 restricted code words. So there is much more restricted code words, which is natural, yes? Uh, in 16 code words with seven symbols, we can have, well, actually 112 different errors. Exactly. Yes. So everything adds up together. This is called Hamming code. I didn't, of course, uh, design it myself. I just used mathematical properties to calculate this allowed code word. And uh, these restricted code words are easy to right you just change one of these symbols yes so this has been calculated yes from data and data is these four symbols so 16 allowed code words can be represented as i have written to you by symbols uh, from 000 to 1111 yes and we add three extra control symbols at the end Yes, and that's how we get total of seven symbol code word. So these control symbols are calculated based on this data payload. I will teach you that next week. Today we are just uh, watching some uh, basic ideas. Yes, how these codes 
operate. But uh, next week we'll discuss group code and uh, that's when I will show you how exactly everything is done, how you can calculate allowed code word, how you can check for errors, how you can find where exactly that error has happened and so forth. So there are two great categories of error correcting codes. Actually, well, you can read much more about error correcting codes in Wikipedia, yes, uh, and there are more information about each of these codes. For example, where is Hamming code, yes, which we'll discuss, you can read about it as well. But I digress anyway, yes, so uh, Coding schemes can be block codes when we split our data into segments, into blocks, and each of these blocks is coded independently and continuous codes. When we do not do any splitting and our data is just uh, an uninterrupted sequence of symbols, and for that purpose we use convolutional codes. We will be working with Hamming codes, which are block codes. Continuous codes are more difficult more advanced material, perhaps for master level studies, but uh, nonetheless, if you find ne it necessary to work with them, you can always find information in internet, and uh, some of the knowledge we will obtain during this course can also help you with that. Yes. So, uh, basically code words are generated uh, for block codes by using matrix multiplication. Yes, so the mathematical background here is matrix multiplication. So we have some message, we have some coding law, yes, so this is matrix of the code and uh, accordingly it needs to be correctly designed and I will teach you how to do that next week for group code and after two weeks for cyclic codes, yes, and you will design your own code matrix from your course project, yes, so for example each of you has his own code in this task, yes, cyclic group with different length of symbols and you will design this matrix of code uh, for your course project. Accordingly, there will be also decoding matrix as well, which checks for errors and corrects errors if they are found. So the idea here is uh, uh, that after coding we will have this message, original message as you can see, yes, 101, it's still here, and check bit or multiple check bits. Yes, it can be one or it can be many. In convolutional code, you calculate check bits after each symbol. So you have received this one, you calculate check bit. You have received this zero, you calculate this check bit. You receive this one, you calculate this check bit. Now, are these codes equal on power of er their correcting uh, abilities? No, this is stronger code. This can correct more errors than this, yes, because it added more redundancy. Yes, we have added here one symbol of redundancy to these three, and here for these three symbols we added three redundancy symbols. So this is stronger code than this. But we'll talk about strength a bit later, how it can be evaluated and how can we tell how many errors code will be able to correct. So the block codes are most widely used technique, of course uh, convolutional codes also are used, but uh, nonetheless block codes are more convenient, yes, because we often divide information to blocks anyway, yes, make packets, make uh, frames in different communication systems and so forth. So the example of the code word is Hamming 7-4 code word. What is this 7 and what is this 4? This 7 is the number of total symbols, and these four is number of information symbols, message symbols, yes. So data block is four symbols, these one, zero, one, one. Correction bits are these three bits, and in total we have seven symbols, yes. So this is the allowed code word. 
uh, legit allowed code word, which can be checked, yes? So we have some mathematical law, math article law, basically some formulas, identities, which we apply to this code word, and if they return correct result, then it's allowed code word. So basically, we check if the code word is correct by using some mathematical approach, yes? And uh, the result shows us, is the code word allowed or is it restricted? If it is restricted, then we can find out the closest allowed code word and accordingly correct that error. That is, uh, well, basically algorithm of how this code works. Now, uh, for block codes, we can work with systematic codes or non-systematic codes. You may have observed that in course project, some of you have in your task systematic, some of you have non-systematic, yes? So what's the difference? The difference is just the order of the symbols. So for systematic code word, here is your message, original message, and here is your correction bits. For non-systematic code, here are correction bits. Now, first symbol of message, now again correction bit, and again next symbols of message. Now, you may ask why may we need to do that? Yes, it's not convenient. We cannot see our message at once. Well, be patient. I will explain that next week. Actually, there is a good reason to do that which is related to the procedure of correcting error. If error has happened, it is much easier for group code to make a correction in this system, non-systematic code word rather than in this. You will see that for yourself later. So also codes can be linear. So for linear code, it's very simple procedure. So if this is allowed code word and this is allowed code word, then after you add two allowed code words together, result will also be allowed code word, yes? Accordingly, for nonlinear codes, it's not true, yes? So if you add two allowed code words, you may not necessarily get also allowed code words for nonlinear. For linear, it's always linear, but for nonlinear, different things can happen, yes? Well, different meaning that it can be allowed and it can be restricted as well, yes? So for cyclic block codes, yes, we, as you have seen, there are some people who have cyclic codes. Cyclic codes uh, have additional property that if you take a loud code word and cyclically shift it by one position, two positions, and so on, then you will also get a code word which is allowed too. Yes, so these two code words are allowed. And this is also allowed. So you can cycle the sheet by two positions, three to the right, to the left, nothing will change. They all will be allowed. They will be different code words, but they will be allowed. And that is a nice property for code, coding and decoding devices, which we will study later uh, for cyclic codes. Of course, not all allowed code words are it's possible to be generated by just cyclically shifting. For example, if we have length of seven, yes, of which four are information, then we can cyclically shift seven bits. For example, I don't know, like this. Yes, in seven different ways, and we get seven different code words. However, in total, there are 16 allowed code words. So out of the 16, by cyclical shifting, we can get only seven of them, yes. But it's not, not a problem. Uh, the main mathematical procedure for these code words to determine are they allowed or are they not is to calculate division. Yes, so we divide by some polynomial each of these code words and we check reminder. If reminder is zero, then the code word is allowed. If reminder is not zero, then this is a restricted code word. And more than that, based by what exactly reminder we have calculated, we will be able to tell well, where is the error. In group codes, having group codes, uh, the approach will be different. There we'll use adding procedure, yes? So we'll have some summation. Now, cyclic codes can be different. 
this is the class of the codes rather than name of specific code. Hamming codes can be cyclic too. Uh, there are both Chathory Hawking and codes which can correct. So Hamming code can correct only one error. Which ha codes can correct two errors, three errors, four errors, even five errors per code word. Yes, so they can correct multiple errors. Now fire codes and read Solomon codes are for non binary code. No, well, for, for error packets. Yes, for error packets. And we already discussed these error packets on our first lecture. So when you have code word and because of some noise interference, multiple symbols have been changed. Yes, so that is the error packet. Uh, Nice example is a scratch on the surface of the compact disk. That is also an error packet. And read Solomon codes are non-binary error packet codes. Yes, so fire codes are still binary. But read Solomon are non-binary. And most often read Solomon codes work with bytes. Yes, as you know, one byte is eight bits. Yes, well, rather than bits, let us say binary symbols. So in binary symbol, uh, we can have more complex errors. So because in binary case, we have zero and one. So all the possible cases is we send zero, we receive zero, we send zero, we receive one, we send one, we receive one and we send one, we receive zero. No other case can happen. Yes, only four different cases. Two of them are correct receiving and well, uh, two of them are error. Now for bytes, it's much more complicated. Yes, for bytes you can send, for example, this byte and receive this byte or any of other 255 possible bytes, yes? Any of them can be received. So there can be multiple errors. And that is actually the packet error, yes? So we don't uh, care where exactly we have received errors. So is it like uh, this error combination? Is it like uh, this error combination? All of them are considered as a one packet error, which has happened in this byte. Yes, and that's why we use this read Solomon codes. We use them for bytes more specifically because often these read Solomon codes are used in memory storage devices for our computers, which, as you know, store information in bytes. So that's hard disks, uh, optical disks, yes, and so on and so forth. Some server operating memory, RAM, random access memory, yes, but for servers, which are ECC memory, yes, error code correcting memory. Usual computers such as our laptops or desktop computers use so-called non-ECC memory, so memory without these error correcting codes. However, for servers, there is a memory which can make this correction of errors because servers are uh, have additional requirements for reliability and so forth, yes. Again, we have talked about interleaving in our first lecture which can help us with these error packets, yes, packet errors, which can be caused by these burst distortions. Here is a nice example of text. Yes, you can see that this is our original text. This is the error packets happened in the channel. And accordingly, here we cannot really see what is received. Yes, this is without interleaving, without. Now we use interleaving, we change the order of the symbols. Now you can see that what we transmit in channel is actually completely random order of symbols, which are still the same letters as here, only in different order. Yes, we can actually find this G, you can see it here, yes. And well, other letters are more difficult to look for. Ah, we have also I somewhere here, probably in error. So the idea is we change the order of the symbols, send it, then packet errors happen in the same places as they would normally happen. Yes. Then we use the interleaving. 
we res re reconstruct, resume the correct order, and you can see that the errors are now split between different positions rather than following packets. Yes, so this can also help much with codes, and actually, to the some extent that, for example, this both child query hooking and code, which is not packet error correcting code with plus interleaving, can be quite good quite good and maybe even actually be on pair with this read Solomon code. Of course, naturally you can say that we can actually add interleaving to read Solomon code as well, and that will make that even better. Yes, that is true. In fact, we can use multiple codes one after another. For example, in DVD, that is actually how it's done. In DVD, we use read Solomon code, then we use interleaving, then we use read Solomon code again to already code the result, and then we again use interleaving. And some visually noticeable scratches are still not a problem for a disk to be read correctly. Yes, if you had some of these disks in your childhood, maybe, yes. So convolutional coding is a little bit different. So the idea there is that we uh, where it was, we put here these symbols in some specific pattern that only a certain combinations can be. Yes, we put here one, not zero, because previous symbol was one. We put here uh, one again because, uh, well, three of these symbols were this specific and these three symbols produced this symbol one. We put here zero because uh, three previous symbols have produced it as zero. Yes, well, it's more convoluted. Yes, <laughs> and these codes are actually called convolutional. Yes, because they calculate uh, the output of the code as the convolution between source information and the coder uh, matrix. Yes. So the idea here is that the transition can happen only in certain direction. So it's quite simple to see it here. So consider that here we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 states, so-called, yes. And we go to other states also 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So what is uh, how it's working here? The idea is very simple. So we can be in this state and receive symbol one or zero, or maybe vice versa, zero or one. Yes, Z we either receive next symbol as one or zero. So if we receive zero, then we go to the next state, which is also zero, zero. So basically, uh, our state is like some memory, yes, zero, zero. The next symbol we receive here is zero, yes. So, well, maybe not really like that. Maybe like that, I will type it, yes, like this, zero. Now we generate coded information, zero, zero, and update this state by replacing the symbol which was previously here with this new one. Zero, yes. So we go from this state to this state and send during the process value zero, zero, yes. Now, if we receive symbol one, yes, if we receive symbol one, then the state is new state will be this one and we go from 0, 0 to 0, 1. And in process we send 1, 1. So the thing is that it is impossible to go from state 0, 0 in any way to state, for example, 1, 1. There is no such transition. It's impossible, right? Similarly, it's impossible to go from 0, 0 to one zero because if we receive symbol one then the last digit is changed not the first one yes so even if we started from this and received symbol one then this last zero will be changed by one not the first one 
So literally impossible to get to this state. Yes. Uh, we can, however, get uh, to from this state to this state. Yes, because uh, what happens with that zero which was before inside here that is it goes to here and this zero which was here goes out yes so if we had here previously one and we received a next one so the previous one will be recorded here and the new one will be recorded here and hence this transition is completely legit However, we cannot go from this transition to zero, zero, yes? So the idea is quite simple. Not all the transitions between the states are possible, yes? And accordingly, this has redundancy. And that's how we, after receiving this information, uh, design some path on this trellis diagram. And this path is actually the code word, yes? So you can see here that we are not yet really sure is it this code word or this code word but eventually if we continue doing it one of these will be lost yes so basically this will be this well it looks like actually this will be discarded yes because here we have calculate the so-called metric yes and this metric is greater so metric is the difference between original and uh, received data so the less is metric, the more accurate is the result. Yes, so that's why we assume that this will be lost. Metric changes be because of the errors. But okay, again, convolutional coding is quite difficult. Yes, the, but the idea is quite simple. We use different transition between states, and only possible transitions are on, only specific transitions are possible. Not all of them. So there are some again allowed transitions and some restricted transitions. Okay, let us then conclude our today's lecture with some uh, questions about uh, how many errors can block code correct and uh, how can we know that? So, the answer to this question is based on a so-called Hamming distance or Hamming metric definition. The Hamming dis distance or Hamming metric definition between two code words is quite simple to find. This is actually the number of mismatching symbols. So consider we have two code words, code word one and code word two. This is first and this is the second. So we find all the differences in these code words. So this is here different, yes. Here it's different and here it's different. Also here and here. The first two symbols are the same. So these five symbols are different and then um, hence the metric is five. Yes, so this is the number of symbols they, these two code words differ. We can actually calculate this as a XOR operation and then just add up together all these symbols. Zero plus zero plus one plus one plus one and the result will be five. So this is actually the number of difference. So for this combination and this combination, the Hamming distance will be one. Yes, because only one symbol is different. So hopefully that is uh, now understand it and we can go further. Uh, we can calculate a so-called code distance. So this is the formula which we can use to calculate this Hamming distance between different symbols by adding them up together by modulus 2. This is just a mathematical formula for what I told you about how to do this. Yes, so we look at this, we find different symbols and we add them up together. Yes, so here is happening the same. We go from the first symbol to the last symbol, use XOR between them and uh, if the result is 1, we add this up and if it's 0, then no change, yes. Now, let us talk about code distance. Code distance is the most important uh, parameter of the uh, code in the respect as it shows how many errors can be corrected, yes. So this is actually the answer to how many errors the code will be able to correct. So the code distance is the minimum having distance for two allowed code words. So if we have multiple code words, 
allowed cold wars, then we need to find the ones which are different, which has the least, the less difference. Yes. So let us say, for example, in my particular case, by analyzing all the possible allowed cold wars, I have found that these two cold wars are the least different ones. Yes. Some code words have five different symbols, some code words have six different symbols. We are only talking about allowed, yes? We don't take any restricted into account. We only look which code words are allowed. Again, you will not have to do that. This is all have been already uh, proven mathematically, derived theoretically, yes? I'm only now telling you about this theory as application, yes? Uh, so, and it turns out that I have found two code words which have difference of three symbols, and there is no more two allowed code words which have any less difference. So then uh, the code distance will be three for this code. Yes, so this is minimum code word. Considering that actually we are working with linear code and we will always have this code word as allowed. Yes, so code word consisting only of zeros. Uh, the task is being even simpler. We only need to find the allowed code word with minimum number of symbols one. Yes, so basically, for example, this. Uh, okay, I have seven symbols, yes, and uh, some control symbols. Yes, so the code word with minimum number of symbols one will show you this code distance because one of the allowed code was is just zeros. Yes, and we only need to calculate how many ones we have here. And that's actually will be the answer to the code distance. OK, but that is again only if the code is linear. We will work with linear codes. Yes, so OK, we have found that code word is three and this is actually true for Hamming code. For block co uh, for uh, group code and um, cyclic code, both of them have the minimum equal to three minimum code word distance. Yes. So this distance affects the number of detected and corrected errors. So in order for code to be able to detect one error the minimum code word distance must be two. So more than this one error by one, yes. Accordingly, for our Hamming code, which has distance of three, we can conclude that it can detect two errors based on this, yes. Because number of detected errors, L, is minimum distance minus one. Now, in order to correct one error, we need minimum distance of three. So for each one error to correct, distance has to be three. So that means that our Hamming code can correct only one error. So the question is, what distance of the code we need to correct, for example, three errors? Three errors to correct, and how many errors it will then detect? The answer is quite simple, yes, so we need to calculate it, so minimum distance minus one divided by two will give us this number of errors, yes. So we need a distance of seven, they mean seven to correct three errors, and this will be able to detect six errors in the code word, yes. So this distance indeed shows us uh, the properties of the code. Now, now maybe let's try understand why do we need minimum distance of three to correct one error. Each code word here is represented by this dot. Yes, so I will mark allowed code word with green dot and uh, restrict it accordingly with red. No, well, no, not maybe red, but magenta. So here is one code word and here is another code word, yes. Uh, and here are restricted code words. So I will not mark all of them. 
some of them only yes. So these code words are different in one symbol. So this is one error in symbol and these are uh, accordingly having G errors. Yes, two, three, five, no matter what, some some number of errors. So each of the allowed code words, yes, should have its own set of restricted code words and it's unacceptable that a restricted code word can be in both of them. Yes, so there are no repeating code words. For that reason, we need to have extra spacing of one here to avoid overlapping. Yes, because if we will not have this one here, then this will be uh, joint point for both of these circle lines. Yes, and this will mean that this restricted code word will have the same distance to this allowed code word and uh, this. Yes, now you can see that uh, this code word is closer to this one. Yes, so that's why it will be corrected as uh, this code allowed code word. Now, if there would not be such one, then the distance would be equal and it would be impossible to tell which exactly allowed code word was expected to be received. Yes, however, because thanks to this extra spacing of one, we now have this problem sorted out. And accordingly, that's how these distances accumulated. Yes, so if we want to check only one error, G is one, then we need a distance of one uh, for this code word, distance of one for this code word, and extra one spacing between these two code words. That would be one plus one plus one plus three. If we'd like to correct three errors, then we would need three plus three for each. Yes, so here is the distance three maximum. Here is the maximum distance three and extra spacing of one, which would give distance of seven. So that's the idea. And this works for each allowed code word. So maybe at the conclusion, some words about modern coding schemes. LDPC coding, which I already mentioned, it relies heavily on matrix calculations. It is not really new. Yes, it's not really new. You can read more information by following this link. And I believe it should be mentioned, yes, that it was actually designed in 1960 years. However, at that time, computational capacities of our systems were not as good. So only recently we returned return to these codes because, well, uh, now we have enough resources to actually use these codes. These are based on so-called sparse matrices, matrix which has a lot of zeros in them. Yes, you can see a lot of zeros. These matrix dimensions can be very large in thousands or even tens of thousands. By tens of thousands, yes, for example, matrix dimensions. So very long blocks. This is proposed to be used for 5G communications, yes, LDPC coding, and the length of such block in 5G proposed communications is 8,448 uh, bits, yes, so quite long blocks. So can correct multiple errors, yes, depending on, of course, matrix, yes. Whether we make one matrix, it can correct a specific number of errors, another matrix can correct another number first. Again, this is closely related to allowed code words about distances between them and so on and so forth. Because matrix is nothing else than uh, the mathematical description of the specific code. Yes, you will all have slightly different codes in your course project and therefore you will also have different matrices for these codes. Yes. And also not so uh, not so old method is called turbo codes. Turbo codes is based on parallel coding. Yes, I already mentioned previously that we can use code one, then code two in series. Yes, however, it turns out that we can actually use multiple coders and encoders at the same time. 
Yes, so basically we send the same data to multiple coders. They produce their outputs and then that is all merged together and sent. We also use interleavers in between. And here is the video link we can follow, which is uh, which can give you more. Uh, sorry, it can give you more details. Yes, uh, if you are interested in turbo calls. Yes, you can see here that actually this is the. Uh, sorry. This is using convolutional codes. Yes, this is a state diagrams of these convolutional codes. And actually, there are two convolutional codes used here. This is one, and this is the second code. Yes, and this is interleaver in between. So this is approach. However, the coding of such codes is uh, also computationally costly. Yes, you have to iterate it. You you won't get answer at once. You will need to perform decoding multiple times. And actually, this also can be good because if you are not satisfied with the result, you can always try and decode a few more times in, in hope to improve the decoding accuracy, yes? So yes, this is the modern method. Okay, for the lecture part, I believe I have told you today everything I wanted to. Next week, we'll start working with more uh, precise codes. Yes, we'll group code some, some examples, some schematics. Yes, uh, so you will be able next week, for those of you who have a group code, you will be able to start working on your course project for the group code. Now, uh, are there any questions? If no questions, then as uh, Mr. Chen told, we will have practical exercise after all today. So we'll work in, well, again, let us make uh, 18 minutes before practical exercise, yes. And at 11.20, uh, Mr. Chen will show you more computations for your course project. Okay, so thank you for now and see you in 18 minutes.